Good morning, everyone. My people. I look out, I see, I see my people. I just had a hip replacement. Come on. Whew. Oh, I'm so jacked to be here. I have heard such good things about you and what God is doing in this place. Uh, by the way, before I forget, <clears throat> on my worst day, you cannot successfully navigate the Christian life without this book. Oh, sure, you may get to heaven. But when you get there, you will have an obstructed view and uh, a limit on how much pie you can have. <laughs> now, I could be wrong, but why would you take the chance? Just get the book. Just get the book. I'll sign it, maybe, if there's enough time back there. I, I usually do a big signature, long thing, but I'll probably just sign it. Uh, but I'd be honored if you got it. That would be so fun. There are $84, surprisingly. I don't know. <laughs> If I had a, a paragraph to sum up where I'm trying to go this morning, it would be this. The objective is not to build communities appearing to have sin under control. The objective is to nurture a place where people can stop faking that they have sin under control. Where they can come out of hiding and let others know and into their sin and failure and their sin loses power. And we can be healed, trusting Christ's redemption, forgiveness, and repentance. It is messy, but it's utterly healthy. And those who live in it become free as they learn to receive love. They, they sin less. I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me just to set up um, this beautiful picture of God. I love this series, Anything But Ordinary, Real People, Real Stories, Extraordinary God. I, I grew up in Southern California, Upland, California, uh, idyllic childhood for the most part. Um, I was a baseball pitcher, and I was really good at it, and I loved it. Uh, we were a Mensa atheist family. My dad was a Mensa member, and we were atheists. And uh, that's how we grew up. That's all I knew. We moved to Phoenix, Arizona. I, I continued being a really good baseball player. I became an all-state pitcher. I had the homecoming queen as my girlfriend. I was student body president. It was really good to be John Lynch back then. And then college came, and I pitched at Arizona State, and I blew out my arm. And here's a sad part of the story. <clears throat> my girlfriend left me for a better pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame her. He had a slider that dropped off the table. I mean, he, whoo, uh, wow. But it did something to me. She knew me so well. How could someone who knew my heart, knew everything about me, how could you go away? What do you do when someone does that? How can you, how can you go on? She, she was it. And I discovered something that had already been introduced to me, but now was in full force. Shame. Right? Guilt says you've done something wrong. Shame says there is something uniquely and irreparably wrong with who you are, and no matter what you do, it's not going to change. And so this kid, this jock kid who had never ever had even a beer, suddenly was on the road in a 60 VW uh, with a rag top pull back, and I was doing every wrong thing I could think of, just wandering around, I don't know, waiting for the end to come. I, I don't know what I was waiting for, D just kind of waiting tables in restaurants, Santa Barbara and Laguna and different places along the coast, and... Eventually, I moved to Tucson, Arizona, and I, and I rose to the high corporate role of the guy who spray paints numerals onto curbs. <laughs> and I was selling my plasma to get more dope. <sighs> and one day I had this thought, J John, you ought, to, you ought to go into teaching. <laughs> Here, kids, come, follow me. But I did. I went back to Arizona State, 
and I got a teaching certification to teach English and drama. And I got a job. I got a teaching job at a at a um, at Arcadia High School. And what I didn't know, the first play that I cast um, in the play, the play, they, they, two thirds of them were young life kids. Now I would never let you talk to me about Jesus before I knew Jesus. But these were kids, and what harm could they do? And they would talk to me after rehearsal about Jesus, and I let them. Somebody during that time gave me a Keith Green album. And I went, whoa, whoa. And then somebody gave me a Slow Train Coming album by Bob Dylan. And I thought, if Dylan's become a Christian, the boat door's about to close. December 23rd, 1979, after getting lost stoned the night before, I, I was about to go out to run. I laced up my 620 New Balances and I was going to go out to run. And instead, I, I don't know if I saw it on Leave it to Beaver, I don't know why, but I went down on my knees. And I said, Jesus, I've been fighting you for so long now. I am so tired of fighting. They tell me that you're the Son of God and that you died on the cross. Please let it be for me. I have no idea what I'll do if you don't accept me now. I'm, I'm, I've burned myself to the end. Okay, gods, all the other gods, listen up. I'm, I'm calling out to, to Jesus. Please come into my heart. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry for this life of running. All right, that's it. I don't know what else to say. I'll see, I'll, I'll see tomorrow if you're still there. Thank you. And I got up. Oh my gosh, you guys. 27 years old, and, and I had done acid, and I had done so many things. that God, I think God just said, you know what? We got to give this boy some, you know, some excitement. And I got out of that prayer, and I was like, just this full of his power and strength and sense of it. I had this sense of, like I could, go, I could go into a Walmart and say, hey, you over there, yes sir, you, fall down on your knees and trust Jesus. And the guy would go, all right. It was incredible. I was, it was during Christmas break and I was reading this Bible. I went down immediately, got a Bible down at the Christian bookstore. I, I knew it had to be a black Bible to be official. And, and, uh, and I got a Bible and I started reading. Never had read the Bible. And I started going through it and I would underline. And then the second time through, I'd make a circle. Third time through, I, I would make a little fireworks. Fourth time through, I, I would write, yay God, in the columns. I was obsessed with learning who he was. I was an atheist family. How can this... Oh my gosh, you love me. Oh my gosh. I can live in you. I'm free. I, I would read everything. Old Testament, I had the, all sorts of Bibles I bought and just spread them out 10, 12 hours a day during that Christmas break. And somebody said to me somewhere along the line, you know what, there's a place for people like you. You need to go to this place. and I, It's a place where they talk about Jesus all day and they study about him and they study the original language. I said, well, I must go to this place. And he said, it's a place called s seminary. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. No, I know those people. Those people, they're the ones with the corduroy coats and the elbow patches. That's a, that's a, that's a different crowd. I, got, I still got dope resin here in my fingernails. It's like, man. But he says, no, God's doing a new thing. Give it a try. So I filled out an application, and, and uh, uh, I, I, I had no money. I had, I had $2,000 from my retirement from teaching, and um, they, they said, uh, how do you expect to pay for this? And I said, I don't, I don't know. Um, tell us about your Christian experiences. None. 
Tell us, have you uh, seen any media on Christian faith? I watched the movie Heidi once. That's, that's all I had. And I turned it in, and they let me in. I went to four years of seminary, got my Master's of Divinity, which allows you to make white chocolate. Um, I learned the Greek. I learned Hebrew. I just didn't, I, I'd, never, I'd never been in church. But suddenly I had this information, and, and it was a great seminary, but something happened in me. Guys, all I wanted to do when I first came to Christ was get on a 10-speed bicycle and, and hit coffee shops all over the country and tell them, look, 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 you guys, this is legit now. You've got to put your trust in Jesus. I, I, if I've come to Jesus... This thing's going to end soon. Come on! And that's all I wanted to do. Instead, now I, I had become this arrogant man who had a lot of information and books. And um, I became uh, like a Pharisee in such a short time. Going from being alive and clean and fearless with no pretense, four years later now, I walked out of seminary with the full appearance of godliness. G -g godliness. Preparing for ministry, I, I could say God in four syllables. How's your walk with God? Uh, huh? Oh, man. Preparing for ministry, I found myself trying to appear pastoral and wise and together and godly. I was pretending to like things that I didn't, and I was pretending not like things that I still did. I was afraid to admit my struggles in my marriage. I was afraid to talk about wrong th feelings and thoughts that I had. In our book, Bose Cafe, we write these words. <sighs> All of us eventually awaken to the pain of realizing I can't control my life the way I thought I could. Stuck with unresolved issues whose symptoms I'm trying to um, fix, all without the help of anybody else. All of us are awakened to the pain of realizing I can't control my life the way I thought I could. Stuck with unresolved issues whose symptoms, hmm, I'm not even trying to fix the issues. I'm just trying to fix the symptoms so I don't embarrass myself and I'm doing it without anybody else. Then we say, what if I could discover an environment, a community, small groups, a family, a marriage, relationships at work? What if I could find an environment so safe that I could tell at least some the worst about me and I would discover that I would not be loved less, but that I would actually be loved more in the telling of it. Oh! That's such a game changer for me. What if I could discover such a place? Well, the answer is, it would begin to heal my unresolved issues. That's how important that gig is. In John 13, 34, Jesus says, I'm going to give you a new commandment. It's not the 11th commandment. It's a whole new order of commandment. And you people who have a new heart, see, that's what happened to us. You know that. Gosh, you've been in this beautiful church that teaches this. You're not a safe sinner. You're not this loser who... Less of me and more of Jesus. Unload that. That was about John the Baptist and only John the Baptist for his role. He doesn't want less of me, miserable me. I'll go to heaven, but I won't have any armrests on my chair. Uh, no, he wants Christ in you. Christ in you. That's who you are. You're fused with him. You're fused with Jesus Christ amalgamated every way at the cellular level. You're not this bad person. He's up there going, yeah, you're going to get to heaven, but I don't really like you that much. He's crazy about you. He, he, he's tied in with you. 
on your worst day. And so he says, I'm going to give you this one commandment. By the way, it's not even like a commandment. It's, it's, it's with this new heart, it's what you most want to do. I want you to love each other. It's not even a command. It's like saying, hey, eat more chocolate. <laughs> All right, if it'll help the team, sure. Love one another. Now, Paul comes along in Galatians 6, 2, and he makes this incredible statement. I'm going to want you to bear one another's burdens. And when you do that, remember Jesus back in John 13, remember 30 years ago? Bear one another's burdens. And when you do it, you're actually fulfilling that one law I gave you. Literally, here's it, here it is. This is our prime commandment. Paul says, bear one another's burdens. Literally, get down, get under, and lift. Draw close to those who are hurting. Not just travel mercies, and not just, but actually when people fail to be able to draw closer and say, I want to stand with you. I'm invested with you. And not go away. See, see all of us were um, created with limitations. All of us, everyone, it frustrates me to death. I've got so many limitations. Why would God, these are not from sin, these are from God. Why would God do that? Why would God give you so many limitations? Here's why. So you could be loved. So you could, see, unless you have a need, you can't be loved. Love is the process of meeting needs. So unless you let me meet a need, I can't love you. I can, I can be impressed with you. I can admire you. But I can't love you. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I'm just learning that, kids, in my marriage, in my life, to allow someone to love me. God says, I love that you've been trying to love me. Would you let me love you? You know everything we're talking about? It's grace. That's what it is, grace. Can you hear it? You can't say grace except for in Irish or Scottish. For this is the manner in which God speaks. Grace, 122 times in the New Testament. My working definition, grace is the absolute and unforced favor gained by Christ's death and resurrection and allows God to be complete completely for us and endlessly in love with us apart from anything we must prove. Grace is an actual realm, a way of life in which we no longer strive for acceptance. We mature and heal and are released into his intentions by trusting that Jesus and all of his power is fused into me, creating an entirely new person. Christ in me, in you. It's so powerful. Sometimes people, oh, grace, it's a nice little sort of idea. That's nice. And I can hear the puppies and the little unicorns and things. And that's nice. But we need real meat. Let me tell you this. You can't solve sin without grace. Romans 6.14, sin will not be master over you because you are no longer under law, but you're under grace. Sin will not be master over you because you're no longer under buckumpism or striving or bluffing or pretending or moralism or anything else. You trust in grace. You're trusting God's ability to do his thing in you. That's what you're doing. Sad part is the opposite's true. Sin will be master over you if you don't trust his grace and you go back to law. I hate that. I hate what I just said. See, it's all over Scripture, isn't it? 
all over Scripture. 2 Timothy 2.1, my son, you be strong, and I expect him to say in the discipline and the strive. He says, my son, you be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. I commend you to God in the word of his grace, which alone is able to build you up. Hebrews 4.16, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Time of need, those tough times, those tight times, those, those chronic times, those t- pandemic times. He says, that's what grace is there for. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Grace, it ignites the power of my new identity in Christ. It neutralizes sin's power by freeing me from the law. You know how that works? How how does grace take away sin's power by freeing me from the law. Let me give it a little illustration. I'm walking along. There's a park on my left, and I'm just walking along, enjoying myself, really enjoying the park, just walking on the sidewalk until I see a sign that says, uh, don't walk on the grass. Huh. Well, I wasn't going to, but I will now. (laughs) <laughs> with all my heart, I will quit my job and, and spell out the lynch name in dead grass in this little park, I'll tell you. That's how the rebellion of law works in everywhere. And Jesus says, I took care of it. I've taken care of the law. You're not under it. You're under this law of love. No. It trades in my anemic strength for his power in a new me. It takes away the weariness of bluffing adequacy. It destroys abandonment, rejection, condemnation. It says you're accepted and loved and enjoyed always. He says he's never disgusted with you. He's never angry with you. Grace pours the blood of Jesus over every offense. Grace puts a robe of righteousness upon me. Grace says, if we ever get a hold of this, it would cause us to fall down and not be able to get up. He says, uh, Jesus says, to the exact extent that, that my Father loves me, to the exact extent that my Father loves me, and I'm thinking that's a lot of love, so also I love you and 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 you. And you, sir, the entire lot of us, to the exact extent that my father loves me, so also I love you? Are you kidding me? Question his taste, but don't question his character. That's what he said. I wrote a piece a long time ago when when my kids were 10 and 8 and 2, and I just said, oh, this... This thing's got a hold, and I, it's okay for me, but what if it's not working for them? And I, I wrote this piece called God's Great New Testament Gamble, where God's turning over all the cards in the New Covenant. He says, what if I tell them who they are? What if I take away any element of fear and condemnation, judgment, or rejection? What if I tell them that I love them, and I'll always love them, that I can't love them any more than I love them right now, and I love them right now no matter what they've done as much as I love my only son? God says that that there's nothing that they can do to make my love go away. What if I told them they were righteous with my righteousness right now? What if I told them they could stop being so beating themselves up and stop being so formal and weird and stiff and jumpy around me? What if I told them I was absolutely crazy about them? What if I told them if they ran to the ends of the earth and did the most unthinkable, horrible things when they came back, I'd receive them with tears and a party? What if I told them I don't keep a log of past offenses of how little they pray or made promises that they don't keep? What if I told them they don't have to be owned by men's religious additions or traditions? What if I told them if I am their savior, they're going to heaven no matter what, it's a done deal? What if I told them that they had a new nature, that they were saints, not saved sinners who should now buck up and be better if you were any kind of a Christian after all he's done for you? What if I told them I actually live in them now, that I've put my love and power and nature inside them at their disposal? What if I told them they don't ever, ever have to wear a mask? 
that it's absolutely perfect to be exactly who they are at this moment? What if they knew they don't have to look over their shoulder for fear? If things get too good, the other shoe's going to drop. What if they know that for anyone who's put any hope in me, that I will never, ever, 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 I use the word punish in relation to them. What if they were convinced that bad circumstances are not my way of even in the score t- for taking advantage of me? What if they knew the basis of our friendship is not on how little they sin, but on how much they let me love them? What if they had permission to stop trying to impress me in any way? What if I told them they could hurt my heart, but I'd try to never hurt theirs? What if I told them I kind of like Clapton's music too? That the these and nows have often confused me. What if I told them I never was that fond of the Christmas handbell deal with the white gloves? What if I told them they could open their eyes when they pray and still go to heaven? What if I told them it wasn't about their self-effort, but allowing me to live my life through them? That's the New Testament gamble. And we're the guinea pig test. Christ in me, will I take advantage of him and do Christianity light? Or in trusting grace, will I have heartfelt obedience? Beautiful obedience from the heart where I can jump up into his lap. Well, I stumbled into an environment of grace. Man, I didn't mean to, but I came there to wow them. I was hired. I came to wow them with my preaching, and instead they loved me and endured me. And gently the environment pulled me from a doctrine of performance and buck-up epistemology and replaced it with identity and grace and love and joy and no condemnation and freedom and trust and safety and vulnerability and playfulness. And that theological shift for the last several decades is causing me to no longer have to hide, to trust others with me, to accept that God is never ashamed of what's really true about me presently. To rest in my new identity and the Spirit's power to grow me from the inside out. To cultivate authentic, vulnerable relationships. Okay, so what, and I'm speaking to the choir, but what if we, we courageously began to nurture relationships of grace? Where godliness is ba- not based on how many, where godliness is not based on appearances of how many wrong things you do not do. Where we applaud exposure and we don't reject those who are failing. Where the environment's safe enough for me to try out my faith instead of bluffing it. Where the goal is not that anything ever gets fixed, but that nothing has to be hidden. What if we learn how to love rather than attempting to manage our sin? Well, I'm an answer to such a question. Because I've learned acceptance and humility and trust. I've learned heartfelt obedience over compliance. I'm able to work harder in grace than by any other motivation. I've worked through horribly hard stuff without having to run. I've learned to trust the power of this new life in me. I'm no longer hidden. I don't wear a mask. I'm able to offer freedom for others not to hide. I'm able and I'm free to offer an authentic Jesus. I no longer am trying to press you with the appearance of godliness. That ship has sailed. Okay, so what if I was real? Well, here you, you guys had me, you brought me all the way up from Phoenix, and, and you, so you, you might think, oh, that guy's been to seminary, he's written a book, he's, he's on his game. What if I was real? What if I let myself be known? Not just transparent appearing with no intention to let anyone help, but what if I really let you know who I really was? Mm, see, I, when I say that, I remember the old girlfriend who left me. But God says, John, I already know, and I know what's coming up ahead, and I will not leave, and I cannot love you any more than I do, and I will not love you less. And if you'll risk it, I'll be the safety net in your exposure. So, um, okay, what if you really knew who I was? Some of this might be fun, some of it is pretty serious, very serious. What if you knew that, um, for example, I didn't relate to or enjoy most of the Christian music that was available the first 15 years of my faith? Man, oh man. I I like a little bit of it, but most of it sounded like skating music. Couldn't, here here was one of the hits. I've got oil in my Ford. 
keep me trucking for the Lord. I got oil in my Ford, amen. Hallelujah. People actually left Jesus because of that song. Are you kidding me? But, but, but let me tell you who I love. Listen to people that I love. I love Tom Waits and Bruce Coburn. Oh, Bruce. These guys are getting so old that I, might, I may never get to hear Bruce again. Justin Vernon and Jason Isabel and the Wayland Jennies. Amos Lee, Mindy Smith, John Hyatt, Bob Dylan. Ellis Paul, David Ramirez, Foy Vance, Pat Metheny, Keb Moe, and a, and a bunch of late 70-year-old guys who play Cajun music down south named Little Feet. Oh! What if you knew that I get really uncomfortable in Christian bookstores? They're so quiet. I want to run around with my pants pulled up a little bit and go, hey, 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 everybody, hey! Hey, we win, remember? And, and if you go up to the counter, they've got mints. Right? Testaments. With little verses written on them. Here, Floyd, come to Christ and have fresh breath. It all weirds me out. Would I be less righteous? Would I be less godly? Um, what if you knew... Oh, that I'm fragile, and I'm not strong. I'm, I'm gifted in mercy, not in ruling. What if you know that, that, that sometimes I'm faithless with incredible fear? What if, what if you knew that um, I can hurt my wife and make her feel stupid? What if you knew that about me? Would I be less godly? What if you knew that, um, oh, I don't want to tell this, but I have started to tell these two things that I don't want to tell. I have neuropathy, really bad neuropathy. It burns my feet and it jeopardizes taking me off the road and it makes me so sad and when it gets really bad, I just want to say, Jesus, let me out of here. I just want to break every commitment and just go home. Get me out of here. What if you knew, oh, I don't want to tell you this because I don't want you to feel sorry. What if you knew four years ago I had a stroke? What if you knew in fifth grade a tough kid made me go down into a rail car and he violated me? I was so violent, I was just this jock kid I never told anyone, never told my parents, never I went through junior high, went through high school, went through college. I, 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 I went my wandering years. I, I became a Christian. I still never told anyone. I was 33 years old. I was afraid. I was afraid if I told you that you would pity me or, or I'd lose my seat at the table. I was afraid that Stacy would be ashamed of me and she'd leave me. I was afraid I'd lose my job. I don't know, it was irrational, but that's, I, I hid it from fifth grade to age 33, and it just happened to come out in a conversation. And now I can't stop talking about it, because everywhere I go, I realize there's those who struggle with the same thing. Now listen to me. Would I be less godly? You just heard my list, and there's more. I'm careful, because I used to think so, but the godly are just those who believe God. Period. Not those who keep from doing enough wrong things. The godly are those who trust God with them. And would others find me to be less godly? See, just the opposite's been my experience. And so the chameleon who spent a lifetime pretending that he was someone else so he could be accepted and loved is gradually learning to believe that he is loved and fully accepted. And, and like the velveteen rabbit, he's becoming the real that he's already been declared. See, what if this is true? And I'll end with this. What if this was true? That for everybody who's put their hope in Jesus, um, it seems like there's this big pile over here of my sin. And Jesus, instead of being here, has had to go all the way around it. And, and, and now he folds his arms and he shakes his head and he thinks, I've had so much hope for that kid, but he's let me down too many times. I don't want to hear about it. 
But what if that wasn't true? What if instead he has walked all the way around that sin and he was never over there? And he walks up to me and he stands in front of me like 18 inches away from my face. And he makes that smile that only Jesus can make. And he says, putting his hands on my shoulders, he says, I'm so crazy about you. I've known everything since before the world began. I love you so much. And then, then he would grab me and pull me into like a bear hug. And I, I want to fight it. I want to say, no, 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 you got the wrong person. Don't, don't, don't hug me. I don't just, please don't, you got the wrong, please, I don't. But he keeps holding me so tight. And then I don't want him to stop. I've waited my entire lifetime to experience his love. And he keeps holding me and he whispers into my ear, I know, kid, I'm not ashamed, I'm not disgusted. I love you so much. I've got this. I've got this. And he keeps holding me so tight. I don't ever want it to stop. And he waits and he waits until he's absolutely convinced that I believe him. And then, (coughs) and only then does he release his grip, and then only so much so that he can put his arm around me. I've done this thing many times. I've pictured this. Jesus here, me standing here, and then Jesus. (coughs) We come together and we look at my sin. I imagine him looking at my sin, then looking at me. I imagine him at some point going, (coughs) wow. (coughs) Don't you ever sleep? And then he said, and we'll deal with it when you're ready, kid. And you're ready in five and four and three and two and one. Christ in me. Guys, this is your Jesus. This is your gospel. This is who you are. This is who you are. It's made for not somebody else. It's made for us. Jesus, would you give the great gift of letting us believe that you adore us no matter what we've done? Because of our choice of you, you live in us and you make no mistakes and we are right on time no matter what age No matter what ails us, we are right on time, and you love us more than we do. Oh, would you allow us to risk embracing that? I pray in the authority and strong name of Jesus for these beautiful people at Anthem Community. Amen.